Thanks. Now, I was going to, as per my abstract, give you kind of a whirlwind tour and summarize the last 20 years of research using cameras in the deep sea, but then I thought that would upset your lunch. If I filled you with that much content, you probably wouldn't have any appetite left over for sushi. So I've, I've narrowed the focus a little bit here, and I'm going to kind of give you a, a bit of a general uh, overview as to why we use cameras in the deep sea. But then I'm going to focus on a couple of specific studies that we've done at the uh, Endeavour hydrothermal vent fields, which will be one of the primary locations for, for Neptune cameras, and then uh, try and finish on a slightly humorous note by showing you some other of, of deep sea cameras for surprisingly weird things. So uh, let's get on with it. This is a Jamstack. Uh, camera package uh, somewhere plugged into one of their uh, observatories off uh, off Japan. So why in the heck do we use uh, cameras uh, to study the floor of the deep ocean? Mainly because you know, observation is still, you know, despite the fact that we've got all sorts of instruments for measuring all sorts of things in, in marine ecosystems, observation direct observation of what's going on out there is still a really important tool. And we take it for granted on land because most of the ecosystems that we study on land we live next to or within. And what's there, how things are organized in space is almost part of folklore or common knowledge as opposed to what we're dealing with out in the bottom of the ocean where we don't really know how that world is organized very well other than seeing things that we might drag up from the bottom. So we're still at a state where if we're working in the, in the marine environment, we still need to, to carry out um, direct observations for a couple of things. One for looking what we call ecosystem state variables, where we look at the, the state of the ecosystem, what's there. And we can't really see what's there just by driving over top of the seafloor with a ship or maybe even uh, having a bit of video to have a quick look at it. We need to have access to essentially snapshots of what's in the ecosystem that we can then study afterward to try and understand uh, what's there in terms of the biodiversity that we have, the abundance of organisms, and then how they're, they're distributed in space, how the, the, the ecosystem is organized spatially, what organisms li live next to what types of, of habitat features, rocks, mud, etc. And then, of course, another important feature of what we call the, the state of the ecosystem are physical features of, of the habitat. What's there? What are they living on top of? Rocks, mud, shell debris, uh, hydrothermal vents, obviously. We have hot water coming out of the seafloor in some areas. And in order to be able to put all that together and, and really get a big picture of a snapshot, if you like, of the ecosystem, uh, we really need to document that. And the only way we can document it in a remote sort of way is to use cameras. And then another thing that ecologists all over the world are interested in are what we call ecosystem uh, processes. How things change. Uh, how populations of organisms change. How energy moves through the ecosystem. How nutrients get cycled, get enter the ecosystem and then get recycled. Or down to the individual organism level, we're interested in, in other processes which are mostly related to, to animal behavior. How do things feed? What do they feed on? How do they go about capturing their prey or finding their food if they're, if they're herbivores? Do they maintain a territory and protect their food resources from other species? Are there migrations? Do things move from one area to the other at different times of year or even different times of, of the day? And in order to study these things, we need to be watching what's going on for which in the deep sea, because we can't sit in a deck chair and observe things directly, we have to rely on, on imagery. Uh, observations, as I said, for, for direct observation, which I mean by like being there and watching what's going on, are really very limited. So you know, we can't expect to spend uh, several weeks sitting on the seafloor in a submersible looking out the window <coughs> and recording what's going on in the, uh, in the ecosystem. So we do need to be able to uh, record observations and then study them later. Time-lapse cameras are, are a case in point uh, for this. 
So what, what cameras allow us to do uh, in, in study of the deep sea is really to have an extended presence uh, on the seafloor. We can leave cameras down there, or we can mount cameras on remotely operated vehicles and, and leave them and record what's going on on the seafloor. So they, uh, they document both the, the state of the ecosystem and by looking at ecosystem state at different points in time, we can start to infer about processes of change in the ecosystem by trying to explain why these two photographs are different when they were taken in the same place. So what, how do we go about using cameras to, to study ecology on the deep sea floor? Well, there are sort of three different approaches which have been accumulating over the past while. The first one, of course, are surveys. That's the basic approach. When we come into a new area, we need to know what's there and where things are. Yeah. So this is using the cameras for that basic first look at an ecosystem where we document the ecosystem state. We can use the cameras to record what species are there, how abundant they are, how they're distributed in space, and we can learn something about what kind of major features there are in the habitat that we can record uh, visually and how the, these habitat features are related to the way the organisms are, are distributed in space. Once we know more or less what the place looks like, then we start getting interested in how it changes. And so there are a couple of approaches to that. One is using, doing time series observations where we uh, essentially have a, a camera which is fixed in space and takes uh, the same picture or uh, of the same thing over a period of time. Um, it could be daily, it could be weekly, depending on how much capacity you have in your camera. It could be that the camera has some capacity to, to tilt, tilt and pan around and, and record more than just a fixed view, but this is essentially a camera which is, which is anchored to the seafloor and is looking in, in at the same general area over time. So we can record some ecosystem change with that. And there are also uh, another approach which is time series surveys where we actually take use cameras and survey very large areas maybe annually to try and understand um, interannual change in abundance of species over a very large area and sometimes that that change might be biased if you're just looking at one little spot you may not necessarily be able to extrapolate from an area of the size of this room to an area of the size of the city of Victoria which many scientists like to do in the deep sea when you only, if you have the only data. So uh, if you're really interested in, uh, in change at the size of several municipalities, uh, you're better off to go out with a, with a ship and, and survey the, the bottom with either a towed camera or an ROV and run a fairly long distance over the seafloor and repeat that every year. And that way you eliminate any, any local bias that might be due to, I don't know, a rock falling over or something and, and wiping out this population that you've been studying for five years, et cetera. So it does remove uh, some of the local bias. So those are the general approaches that, that people use to study uh, the dynamics of ecosystems in the deep sea. And indeed, these are the same kinds of approaches that we're going to be using um, with the Neptune cameras uh, in Barclay Canyon uh, and at the Endeavor Hydrothermal Vents and also um, in, at the Folger Passage site. Um, Looking at change at different scales, obviously the closer we get up to the shallower uh, parts of the world, the more rapidly things tend to tend to change. So uh, we'll be probably looking at things at, at, at different time scales. Or at the hydrothermal vents where change is also very fast, uh, we'll also see, see things. So what I'm going to do now is to take you to the Endeavor hydrothermal vents and give you a couple of examples of use of cameras for research projects that I've been involved in in the last last decade or so, maybe in fact even goes back even further than that. And just to give you an idea of what we can do with, with, uh, with cameras uh, in this environment. So this is the main endeavor vent field here. These little yellow blobs here that we see here correspond to these high, big hydrothermal chimney structures that are on this hand-drawn map um, over, on, over on the right. Okay, they all have names and these are all very large structures uh, that can be up to uh, 20 meters high and, and quite massive. These are big chunks of rock that are spewing out uh, hydrothermal fluid. And the area that I'm going to focus on is one small chimney complex here known as SNM. 
which is on a uh, situated on the edge of a fracture, as you can see here. So this thing um, uh, looks something like this in, in a sort of artist reconstruction of it. So we have a number of uh, chimney structures that have fused at the base um, together. They're all connected to an underground plumbing system here, which is supplying hydrothermal fluid, which is coming up through the central core of these, these structures, and then coming out through various uh, orifices, sometimes at very high temperatures, for example, putting out black smoke here. Here we are. This is a photograph of the, uh, of the summit of one of these towers on S&M, where we still see 350 degree fluid uh, coming out here. So I've had a couple of uh, graduate students in my lab who've used cameras to do different types of time series observations, well, first surveys and then time series observations on S&M to learn a couple of things. One is, is trying to understand uh, the general overall colonization of the chimney by different, different uh, communities of event organisms. And another was a very focused study on the behavior of one particular uh, uh, worm, which we find lives quite near the, the tops of these things where, uh, where the smoke is black. So I'm going to kind of summarize the, those two studies for in both of these cases. So if you arrive at the base of S&M, uh, with submersible, this is what you see. Kind of a, this is the base of the chimney. This thing goes on up for another uh, five to ten meters. You can't see it in a single photograph simply because it's so big and light attenuation underwater is is so much. So we're really looking at kind of the uh, the nose of the elephant here. But uh, much of what we see is like this. You can see that there's this is not bare rock. It's colonized by all sorts of crinkly, uh, squirmy looking things. Uh, these are uh, the various specialist hydrothermal vent species, many of them are worms, and some of them are tiny little um, snails. And even without zooming in, you can, you can once you have the, a trained eye, you can tend to spot the difference between the two. This kind of granular texture we see here are these tiny little snails on top of, of worm tubes, which make the longer structures. The red patches here are gills of another species of worm that are all in little, uh, little groups together. And then the pure white material is, are all uh, groups of, uh, of small snails. So these chimneys are almost entirely covered uh, with uh, different types of hydrothermal species, as you can see in kind of a patchwork uh, manner. So what I had a PhD student who started off trying to make some sen sense of all this. So what we did with the, uh, with the ROV is we conducted um, surveys, essentially ran lines up from the base to the summit of the chimney, and we'd move over and we'd come down again. And we surveyed uh, the sides of this chimney uh, three years in a row. And uh, at the end of the first year, what we did was uh, make a map of, first of all, we identified what we called were visually distinct uh, groups. Just on the naked eye, like this patch here, stood out as being different from something else. We later went in and sampled it to, to actually demonstrate that this was indeed uh, a different community of species than what we see elsewhere. But initially, we were just kind of winging it here and, and using that as a first, first guide to, uh, to see what's going on. And at the end of that, we put together kind of a hand-drawn map here of the structure with the different colors representing the distribution of these different uh, uh, animal communities. And after that, we laid an electronic grid on top of it so that we could then uh, work out how much surface area was colonized by these different communities and came up with a simple pie diagram that tells us you know, which are the most abundant uh, communities on this structure. And we repeated this exercise three years in a row. And every year, this distribution map looked different. And every year, uh, the pie diagram looked different. So that told us that this is a really rapidly changing environment, uh, much more so than, than we actually anticipated. After that, we got interested in understanding why. I mean, obviously, if, if whole communities are shifting um, spatially on the, on the chimney here, maybe that tells us something about how the habitat is changing. So what we then decided to do is we had to partner with a chemist to give us some information on the association between these different communities that we identified and habitat conditions. And obviously, the most overwhelming, important habitat factor in this environment is the hydrothermal fluid that's coming out all over this chimney here at different concentrations. In some areas, it, it's, it's just blowing out like a jet with really warm fluid, uh, rich in hydrogen sulfide. 
and in other areas for some of these communities, you can barely detect a temperature difference from the surrounding deep sea. So we got organized with a, uh, a chemist who had a chemical scanner, which we connected to the uh, one of the arms of the Thoropo submersible. And this little uh, probe here, we would put next to our different communities. And we did 85 of these separate uh, measurements. And what this thing does is it pumps in a hydro water from this environment, it follows a tube up, and it goes into a chemical analyzer on the submersible. And up on the ship, where we're controlling this operation, we see this readout here on, on the screen where we're looking at um, hydrogen sulfide, uh, iron, manganese, and, and temperature concentrations uh, in the habitat that these worms are, uh, or these different species are actually inhabiting. So it allows us then to, to work out why things are where they are in terms of habitat conditions. And we were able to demonstrate statistically that indeed there is a really strong uh, habitat influence on who lives where, which then allows us to say, okay, well, the reason why things change from one year to the next is because we're getting shifts in where the fluid is coming out. And that's happening all the time, which means that these, these communities have to be adapted to a life where their environment is changing at a scale of weeks or months. And they have to be either mobile or really fast growing in order to keep up to it. Because sometimes it may shift right out of, of the conditions they can normally tolerate for, for life. These are the close-ups now of these different communities. So this is the, the top end, the summit of the chimney, looking down slope. So we've kind of tipped the submersible on its nose, and we're looking downhill towards the base. It's, you can't even see it, it's so dark down there. So this is the growing end of the chimney. These things grow up and part, and then it gets cooler as we work our way down. So you can see at the hottest end of the chimney here, we have colonization by, it's pretty scarce, okay? There's this worm here that we see living in these white tubes, and a few of these uh, slightly fat worms, and that's it. And as we move downhill where conditions are cooler, where there's less hot fluid coming out of the walls of the chimney, life gets to begin, becomes more abundant, okay? And then as we move further down, we get to this community that I was telling you about here where we have tons and tons of uh, snails here. You can't even see the individual snails. If you look really closely here, you can see a whole bunch of snails stacked up on top of each other. But there are up to 50,000 uh, little snails per square meter of chimney surface here. They're really abundant in this environment. And then right down at the base, um, where the chimney is in contact with the seafloor, things are a little tougher. You can see that there's very little fluid coming out of the walls here. There's some areas that are totally bare of, of vent organisms, and some areas where we have what look to be dying uh, tube worm communities. So these tubes here are the same worms that we were looking here. Okay, So this is what it looks like during the sort of dying part of the chimney. So these chimneys are hottest at the top and coolest at the bottom. And as they grow up, uh, the fluid flow essentially peters out at the bottom. And there's nothing left. And these things just kind of fade away and die. So that's, we've kind of gone from one extreme habitat to the other. And this is, this is the end of the life process on chimneys. Eventually, it'll all be bare rock here and, and then start to dissolve away. This is, there's nothing here at all. Is, is yeah. There's nothing else there but old tubes here, and these things that look more like uh, Christmas tree decorations are old tubes that are entirely colonized by limpets. Okay, so these are little like little snails, so they're just using the tube as a surface. So that's why they look uh, they're hanging a little straighter because there's more weight on them. <coughs> okay, now I'm going to tell you about another story which is a little bit more focused, and was. Uh, one of those little bits of serendipity where you start off doing one study and end up discovering something that takes you in another direction. And I had a uh, master's student um, who was very interested in studying uh, the behavior of this worm that we see here living in these tubes. You can see here's one that's stretched out of his tube and it's kind of crawling around on the surface. I'll give you a little zoom here to show you what they look like. So this is called the sulfide worm, and it lives in this, it builds this tube here, and it sticks its tube to the sides of these, the hottest part of these um, hydrothermal chimneys. And it comes out of its tube, and essentially reaches around on the surface and scrapes bacteria off of the rock, and that's how it makes its living. Okay, and sometimes they live quite close together, but most of the time you can see that they're, back up here, they're fairly evenly distributed on the surface here. There seems to be some order in the way that they're distributed, 
on the surface, as opposed to this other worm here, the bigger one, where they're all heaped on top of each other, or those other species. So, so the minute ecologists see order in any kind of distribution of species in the environment, we get suspicious. Because that means that there's some, something there that's maintaining this organization. Okay? Just like in human society. Okay? If, if the police disappear tomorrow, we know what it's going to be like on the roads in a couple of weeks. Okay? Well, same thing down here. There's some kind of force here which, which is making these worms all live in a fairly organized sort of way, not necessarily too close to one of their neighbors. So we started asking, so we said, okay, let's start doing some behavioral observations and see if there's some behavioral reason for these things to be doing this. So we essentially take the Ropo submersible and we park in one front of one of these structures, take some overall shots, and then zoom in on some of these smaller groups of worms and watch what's going on. For about, we did about uh, three or four hours um, every day of this type of observation, essentially observing these worms. And what we discovered is these worms all maintain a feeding territory, and they do so um, by aggressively defending it against their neighbors using this weapon here. So this is the business end of the worm here. And if you count down to the seventh segment here, you see this little black dot? We pull that up. There we have it, these two nasty hooks. And essentially that's what they use to defend their territory against their neighbors. So I'm going to show you a little video clip where we're going to see a couple of, first of all, I won't start it just yet. There are a couple of worms here. It'll become more clear when I start the video. This guy here and this guy here are both going to come out of their tubes and start feeding in this area. Then at one point they're going to touch their branchy. Okay, so these are their gills here, these things that are sort of star-shaped. Okay, that's, and underneath that is their mouth. So they have got these big gills that spread out in space, and underneath they've got a mouth with these little tentacles that are kind of feeling around on the surface, scraping up bacteria. And every once in a while they will bump gill filaments here. And you will see that the reaction is that this one here will coil back and then strike at his neighbor with his claw extended and give him a good thwack. So here we go. Okay, so now they're both out feeding. You can see the hydrothermal fluid coming up here. This one, over, he's working, he's minding his own business. So these things don't have eyes. See? They can't see each other. This is all contact. Okay, this will blow, blow up. He's going to reach out. He's going to touch his neighbor. He's going to coil back, stick out his claw, and give him a good thwack. Okay, and they do this constantly. So what we, what we did is a kind of a behavioral diagram where we started looking at, at we broke down their behavior into a bunch of different categories here. We call forecourt sweeping when they're kind of sweeping in front of their net, exploring the substratum, exploring their tubes or their neighbor's tubes. They spend a lot of time doing this, like cats. Okay. Or every once in a while there would be a contact with a with a conspecific. Conspecific is another worm of the same species. So we started following okay, what do they do? Okay, if they're sitting here inactive, what is the next activity they get involved in? And it's always some kind of ex the thicker the arrow is that means the, the more they're going to go and do something else. So you go from inactivity to exploring the substratum, and then that leads to contact with a conspecific. Some of those contacts end with striking behavior like that, and in which case they go back to inactivity or they go hide in their tube, depending on who wins the, uh, the bout. So that's another kind of thing that you can do uh, with cameras, and certainly something that I want to carry, follow up on uh, when we do have the, the Neptune camera at Endeavour is to move to the next chapter of this worm behavior because this, first of all, this is a great thing to, I thought I gave this uh, a presentation of, the, of this worm combat to a grade 6 class at uh, Bayside Middle School in Brentwood Bay last year and I had to show this video eight times. <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't get enough of it. Okay, but I, I could, probably the next topic on a prettier note here is to use cameras also to document, I said min documenting ecosystem state. This is one of the prettiest places um, at the Endeavour Hydrothermal Vent Fields. This was right, this was how the summit of the S&M uh, chimney complex looked during the middle of the 1990s. There were these beautiful black smoker chimneys here and these gorgeous uh, tube worm communities here which I can zoom in on and see uh, these really pretty worms here. These are their branchial filaments, their gill filaments sticking out of their tubes, which we can see here is a close-up of one of these tubes. So these are the famous uh, vestimentiferent tube worms that uh, 
whose, whole, whose bodies are filled with symbiotic bacteria, and they make their living off of the hydrogen sulfide gas that's coming out of, out of the vent fluids. And it turns out the ones with the really fluffy gills are the ones that are the, the most, make the greatest contribution to reproduction of the species because they use their gills to, to pass sperm packets back and forth between each other. So I'll just end with my little wallpaper shot here of a kind of a blow up of, of one of these things. So that was another discovery that the Verena uh, made with, uh, with the camera was we started taking just pretty shots like this and then she started noticing, I don't have any picture here of a sperm packet, but they're not all like exciting to look at anyway. Uh, but she started noticing that there were sperm packets in the, uh, within the gill filaments in these particular, uh, particular variety. And then it turns out that this community here, which is, which is the rarest of all the different types of tube worm communities, uh, turns out to be the most important one for reproduction. That's one thing we're going to work on uh, on this summer, is to go and, and try and confirm that idea. They don't feed on anything. They don't have a mouth. Okay, they live entirely on symbiotic bacteria living within their, within their tissues. So the, their only exchange with the outside environment is through these gills. Uh, they're breatharians, if you like. Uh, they take in hydrogen sulfide, oxygen, and CO2 from the seawater, and they pump it down through their blood to the bacteria, which live in this giant organ that, that occupies most of, the, most of the tube that they live in. And the bacteria uh, oxidize the hydrogen sulfide and use that energy to convert CO2 into, into sugars, and uh, essentially at which they share with worm. So this, this animal has no digestive system, no mouth, no nothing. It's only... Oh yes, lots of mitochondria. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the, the animal part is, is still... still looks like an animal, it just has no gut. And uh, it, it's entirely dependent on the symbiotic bacteria for... to make a living. Okay, well I'll, I'll uh, stop there. Mm -hmm. And let you uh, answer questions if you like, but I'm not going to show you any more slides. It is in the near term probably a totally different branch in that uh, certainly there will be opportunistic sampling of these areas during our servicing cruises, so we could supply material for gene sequencing, but we don't have uh, an underwater gene sequencer next to, yet that we can plug into into the system. It's, I'm not laughing. There, it's not far away. There are there are some uh, systems that won't necessarily do sequencing, but you can you can you can actually collect DNA and use probes to identify uh, different genes. Uh, immaterial, but obviously that's that's quite an elaborate machine, and you have to essentially suck up material from the environment, extract the DNA from the cells, and then analyze the DNA within the machine. So it's a pretty complex piece of hardware to to develop. But there are already prototypes out there that are being used um, on moorings, mainly for looking at bacterial DNA because it's a lot easier to um, extract uh, to to access the DNA in single cells than it is to essentially grind up uh, an animal like this in order to get the DNA out of it. Okay, who knows? Okay, time to stop here. Right. Taking okay, up too much of your time.